Welcome. My name is Dr. James Norrie and I'm the co-author of your textbook. The textbook, Introduction to Business Information Systems, the third Canadian edition, was designed to help students become more familiar with the obvious need to learn more about information systems. We've designed these mini lectures to be of assistance to you by identifying key points in each of the chapters and to briefly provide our perspective as authors on why we think there is value in you learning more about them. We hope that you find them helpful. During my career, I've had the privilege of teaching thousands of students about introduction to information systems. And you might be wondering why you're going to study this. One of the things that we're going to do is spend some time thinking about IT, not just in terms of IT, but IT as it relates to any possible career you can imagine in any part of society, in any type of organization, for profit, not for profit, government, or anything else you might choose to do. So I think you're going to find some real value in this. One of the first things I want to start with is what we cover in Chapter 1, and that is the pace of technology change in business innovation. This is also known as Moore's Law. The underlying principle of Moore's Law is that the opportunity for technology to change at a rapid pace in terms of its underlying power, that is a doubling of the power of the computer itself, has led to a massive re revolution in the application of technology to our everyday lives. Moore's Law has been a very stable part of understanding information technology system for many decades now. And in fact, probably long before you were born, your mother and father may have learned a little bit about information systems. In the days when they were tucked away in rooms someplace where everybody wore white uh, suits and they had cards to get in and pocket protectors and beanie caps, when the information technology systems were remote and isolated and clearly not something that most people had anything to do with. Today it's just the opposite. Who doesn't have a device like this today? A smartphone where we go directly to the internet, directly to the applications. We use this device to access computer systems, information systems. These information systems have a much broader definition today than the narrower one of old. In fact, in many instances today, you're even unaware you're using information systems. In your car, when you drive, your GPS system is a type of information system. So what systems do today is they help us in our everyday lives. They help us turn data and information into wisdom and knowledge. The very power of information systems is what drives society today. So as a student of anything, it's really important that you learn more about them. A brief story, booking travel. Many, many, many years ago, there was a time when in order to book travel, you had to go to somebody, a travel agent. You sat in a travel agency. And maybe if that travel agency was big enough and sophisticated enough, it might have had an information system it used to book your travel, business or vacation. Not anymore. Today, you go directly to the provider of the travel service. You book it online. You do everything that you need to do with not a human in sight. It's you and the computer. We call this disintermediation. And the notion of information systems replacing how we used to do things is a big part of innovation. In fact, in business today, the key part of global competitiveness is understanding how to deploy information systems to create new value. We are creating new business models. For instance, the online auction. We're creating all kinds of opportunities for businesses and organizations and governments to deliver goods and services directly to the end consumer through technology. So it really is important that you learn about this. But it's also important that we not forget that along with technology are people and process. And in fact, in chapter one, we spend a lot of time talking about this triangle, this virtuous triangle of making sure that technology is designed the way we want to use it. Some of you may have heard in the news recently the lawsuit between Apple, as an example, and Samsung. Much of that revolved around something really important called a GUI, a graphical user interface. What in fact this talks about is how intuitive it is for us to access technology. If you own an iPhone or if you own a Galaxy Tab, you're really clear just how similar they are. And so were the jury. And one of the things that we need to remember when we're looking at technology is that the art of making complex technology simple to access is a hugely important part, part of technology design. So when we think about technology, we can't, about, we can't forget about people 
the ultimate users of the technology. We also can't forget about process, business process. Every organization, as you'll hear in later chapters, has a structure that is designed to deliver their goods or services, and they do it through the repetitive execution of business process. Technology enables those processes. So the triangle involves having great technology that's innovative and clearly the best possible technology we can use to enable processes designed to be efficient and effective with the least amount of friction, that is that they move quickly and they do the things they need to do, and with an intuitive way for people, usually the consumers of those goods and services, to access your technology. And that's really what chapter one is all about. We need all three. We also spend a lot of time in chapter one trying to talk about what's in it, IT, that is, for me. And how you use all different types of systems in your career based on your chosen career path. Let me, as an example, talk about accounting. Many of you may have studied accounting or will study accounting at some future point. And what you'll learn about is how we make general ledger entries, debits and credits. Well imagine, decades ago, those were actually made on cards with debits and credit columns. They were done by hand with somebody writing what the debit and entry credits were. Now, accountants rely completely on computers. So if, as an example, you want to be an accountant, you're going to need to learn a lot about IT and accounting systems and the audit trail. You're going to need to understand how to delve into systems and extract detail that perhaps the users of the system don't. You're going to have to learn to figure out whether the system has integrity and in fact is protected around privacy and security to make sure the transactions can't be altered. You need a lot of knowledge about information systems to be an accountant. Or let's say you want to be a marketer. Same kind of thing. Perhaps your long-term goal is to come up through the sales and marketing side and eventually become the CEO. Well, in marketing today, you are going to use information systems endlessly to extract information about consumer behavior. And we'll talk about that later in one of the chapters of the textbook as we talk about how marketing has now become e-marketing. Not only is the technology the primary delivery of the goods and services to the customer, but it's the primary analytic tool that we use to watch very carefully how consumers behave online. That means as a marketer, you need to know something about IT. So no matter where we look in business, no matter what kind of organization structure you have, no matter what its strategic goals, chances are good that technology plays a really important part in all of that. And that's why you need to study technology. So as we approach the end of our chapter one, mini lecturette, we need to also think about ethics in an increasingly digital world. And we finish chapter one with a discussion about some of the societal challenges we all face. And some of these are quite bold and quite new. I often ask my classes in the first week or so to put up their hands if they download music. And all the students put up their hands and they say, of course, sir, we download music. And then I say, leave your hand up if you pay for it. Well, all their hands usually go down. One of those issues that you'll find identified in chapter one is, what do we do about the fact that that's theft? And although it's theft of intellectual property, and it may not feel the same as, for instance, shoplifting, it really is no different. It's stealing somebody else's property and not paying for it. Now, we've explored in class in many debates and some of the questions that are embedded in the textbook, maybe your professor will use to have those kinds of debates in your classrooms. I'm going to tell you, we've talked about all the angles of this, and, and at some level, it's clear that many people feel entitled to do that. But it's still a societal challenge. It challenges the underpinning of a capitalist system and it, prevents, it, it pre presents, if you like, the darker side of some of this technology. How do we master that? What about the issues which occur so frequently around the misuse of cell phones to take pictures that are inappropriate, to post those on Facebook? How about the fact that our entire private lives are now public? There's a dark side to any technology and one of the things we hope to help you master during these lectures and as you read the book is to understand the risks and rewards of technology, not just at the individual and organizational level, but at the societal level. And it is at all three of those levels, individual, organizational, and societal, that we need to understand the impact of technology. So as we move on, and later in chapter two, you'll learn more about the heart and soul of technology and everything to do with hardware and software and middleware, for now we'll leave it at that. I challenge you to get into this textbook as best you can, 
to look at the issues from all those three perspectives and to understand that today, in many instances, IT is the business. See you soon.